Welcome back to another episode of Conversing Labs, Reversing Labs podcast. Every couple of weeks, we're coming to you with the best minds in information security, threat intelligence, threat hunting, application security. And this week, we are thrilled to have one of our own researchers here at Reversing Labs, Joseph Edwards, with us. Hey, Joseph, welcome. Thanks for having me on, Paul. This is your first time on Conversing Labs. Yep, definitely. Excited to be here. So we have you with us today, Joseph, because you just published a research report, which we published on our blog, taking a look at some research that you did into a ransomware threat, kind of, called AstroLocker 2.0, and um, a really interesting campaign that you discovered, a little bit atypical, um, and we want to have you in to talk about what you found. Um, but before we do that, um, could you just tell the audience, Joseph, kind of, what your role is here at Reversing Labs and uh, what type of work you do. Sure. Sounds good. So um, at Reversing Labs, I'm a senior malware researcher. Most of what I do is searching across the Thai cloud uh, file corpus and looking at kind of everything we have. And um, and as many of our viewers know, it's it's a lot of files per day. So it definitely does take a good amount of threat hunting and sort of knowledge of different malware techniques. Um, my goal is to kind of figure out what our specialty is at reversing labs. And, you know, we do a lot of static analysis. So, you know, we are capable of finding things that some antiviruses might have overlooked. So that's kind of where my approach was on hunting for these threats um, and in hunting for threats in general, you know, anything that is going to trip up normal antivirus using typical uh, evasion techniques or obfuscation techniques are something that we're interested in. So how did you come to focus on AstroLocker 2.0? That was the result of just some hunting um, on Twitter. You know, somebody had reached out on Twitter saying that there was a sample uh, of a malicious document and they were unsure, they were unable to get it to run in a sandbox. So it, it, we have a piece of malware that's doing some... Uh, sandbox evasion. So that's something that might trip up antivirus or it might trip up automated sandboxes. So I thought it'd be a good idea to, to uh, take a deeper look. Interesting. And, and that's pretty common in modern malware, right? That they'll try and detect if they're being run in a sandbox or a virtualized environment, which a lot of security companies use to, to analyze what does this thing do when you run it, right? Definitely. Um, and there's a range of how sophisticated those techniques can be. Sometimes they're just looking for processes that are running that look suspicious. And sometimes they're going as deep as looking at hardware serial numbers to see if it's related to certain sandboxes or certain antiviruses. So um, in this case, it wasn't uh, that the threat actor was super sophisticated, but you know the packer had a lot of um, anti-evasion uh, anti-sandbox methods in it. So um, let's talk about AstroLocker. Um, this is a fairly recent um, entry in the ransomware world, and it seems to have its origins in the Babook uh, ransomware family. Is that right? So this this is something, uh, AstroLocker, that was first identified, I think, last year in 2021. What, what do we know about AstroLocker? The attribution is a bit unclear. The Babbit group, of course, is a ransomware as a service group, so it can be it can be difficult to tell what affiliate launched what ransomware attack. Um, and of course, they do sell builders um, for each affiliate to build their own uh, piece of ransomware for a campaign. Um, I think the interesting thing to note is that they did have a source code leak last year um, that was kind of going around. And that was kind Bob of Babook uh, ransomware did yes, yes. yes. Babook ransomware had a source code leak, and um, it does seem related to the proliferation of AstroLocker and AstroLocker 2.0. So um, definitely related to the Babook group, but not necessarily uh, attributable to them or their affiliates. And one of the things that you observed about this campaign when you were analyzing it uh, is that. Unlike most, you know, ransomware infections, this one basically cut right to the chase, basically, like 
it was it was using uh, Microsoft Word documents as as lures. That's not that unusual. But when you open the Word document, it immediately went to install the ransomware, which I think is I don't know. You'd have to explain, but I think that's pretty unusual, isn't it? To have, to have the ransomware be the first piece of malware that's delivered. Yeah, it definitely is um, very unusual. And you know, first first thought, first glance is, oh, this has got to be some kind of mistake. It's got to be somebody just playing with a payload. Um, but when you start to look a little deeper at it and do some hunting, um, not just on this sample, but across other samples using um, the same packer, you're kind of seeing that, um, you know, not only is it strange from a technical perspective, you know, typically ransomware um, is not deployed until an attacker has control of multiple systems, ideally a domain controller, and they can proliferate ransomware out to all of the different hosts at the same time. So that's typically the strategy. But one thing that is very interesting about this sample is that clearly once this source code gets out and it gets into the hands of uh, attackers who are trying to monetize as quickly as possible, um, you may not have traditional ransomware strategy. And so we can't necessarily get too comfortable in how we think about ransomware. Yeah. And clearly, you know, a technique like this can still have impact. Yeah. I mean, we're used to talking about the MO of, you know, ransomware groups and affiliates is to expand your reach, to own as many valuable IT assets within the environment. Often these days to have already exfiltrated a fair amount of data that you're going to also use to extort the victim. And then at the very last stage in the attack to actually spring the trap, launch a ransomware and obviously cripple the, the victim's uh, environment with the, with the ransomware, but um, clearly not the objective here. Um, what do we know about um, like who was targeted? What types of organizations were targeted with this and whether this was a money-making endeavor for the attackers or just kind of a proof of concept attack? I mean, that's a good question. We can get a little bit of indication into, um, you know, what their motive here was. I would say that this looks a bit like uh, attempting to develop a payload or test antiviruses or, you know, um, test some aspect of development or uh, just an attacker getting a hold of the source code and trying different different methods of packing it. Um, because as I noted in the article, one thing that's odd about this sample is once you uh, detonate it and decrypt the ransomware note, you find that the email is actually missing. So there's not an, there's not a way for the threat actor to be contacted by the victim. There's no way for them to send the victim a decryption key. Um, so that lack of quality assurance in this sample actually makes this piece of ransomware into something basically destructive. There is not uh, a straightforward way to recover your files if you're encrypted with this uh, sample. And so clearly if, if they were um, practicing uh, quality assurance, quote unquote, uh, and yeah. attempting to get their money uh, realistically, they would have uh, included all of those, all of that information in there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely a, another strange thing about the sample. Yeah. They kind of had the astro locker at as the email address, but no domain. <laughs> right. So, so that's not a real email address. And obviously, like, as you said, those email addresses, like you need a support address basically to help the customer affect the, you know, complete the payment get the decryption key and kind of complete the transaction. So there's actually a fair amount of interaction between the victim and the attacker um, in, in, in most normal, you know, ransomware situations. Right. Um, and that all yeah, happens and, through that support email. Yeah. yeah. And for good reason, because, um, you know, any ransomware that is attempting to sort of automate uh, that decryption process, you know, malware researchers like myself have, typically found vulnerabilities in that. So it's very common for attackers to set up a communication channel um, 
and not attempt to have a centralized infrastructure for sending in payments and sending decryption keys um, because typically they need to um, be, because typically it's it's public key encryption so they need to uh, provide the decryption key so, so when we look at this you said that that there was the um, obviously the theft and, and leak of the Babook source code back in 2021 um, and that that may have given rise to Astrolocker um, as a kind of um, fork of the of the bad book um, ransomware. Um, when we look at the sort of f functionality of these, are, are they pretty similar? And when we look at these attacks that you analyzed, are there similarities between those and the I mean bad book attacks that we saw back in 2021? I think bad book first appeared in early 2021. So so some of those affiliate attacks that we saw during 2021. Sure, yes. Um, they're pretty much 98% similar. Um, same encryption algorithm, um, same exclusion list of processes, same services and processes killed in order for the ransomware to, to, to run. Um, the differences are pretty much cosmetic. Um, you know, the, the ransomware has kind of a personalized AstroLocker 2.0 in the ransom note um, and the well of, of note of course are the Bitcoin and Monero wallet addresses um, and those are also important campaign markers you know wherever they want you to send the ransom is is definitely going to be um, something that you want to track and so I noticed that the Monero wallet address was related to uh, the Chaos Ransomware gang, um, which is not really affiliated with Babuk per se. Yeah. They have their own .NET ransomware called Chaos, and there's different versions of that. Um, so there, there is a bit of there is a bit of overlap between these two actors based on that wallet address. Um, and I also noticed that the Bitcoin wallet address, if you were to pay your ransom in Bitcoin, is related to a couple other AstroLocker 2.0 campaigns. Um, this one specifically, to just to differentiate between other AstroLocker 2.0 campaigns, um, it seems that they were testing out uh, using this specific packer called Safe Engine Shielden. It's very mm -hmm. old, uh, not really supported. Um, I would say if you wanted to <laughs> block anything packed with this packer, you would probably be doing yourself a service rather than a disservice not going to be a lot of false positives right yeah yeah and what can we really um infer from that so you've got you know the bitcoin wallet goes seems pretty consistent with the earlier astrolocker campaigns um the monero wallet this other ransomware group <laughs> It's really, it's like trying to piece together. I, I imagine like the police dramas where they've got the board and like the pictures with like the string attaching them or something. It's a, it's a really confusing picture. It makes me wonder, was this just somebody's half-assed effort to kind of just push something out there and kind of cobble together a campaign from like little disparate pieces that they grabbed from different places? or Or like you said, is it sort of, it was a work in progress that maybe got out early or they released it without really having fully completed what they needed to complete. It's like you're trying to kind of figure out what, what the intention was here. I don't know if you have any thoughts about what that is. Sure. And I think um, Intel analysts would be able to probably give the full uh, picture of the uh, full picture of the scene. And this is, I think uh, an interesting piece of the puzzle because you have one group, the Baba group, who are developing pretty uh, tight, I would say, ransomware, not easy to find chinks in the armor of, of Baba originally. Mm -hmm. And with the source code leak, um, you have a bunch of different threat actors either attempting to use uh, this, the builders from the source code leak or to basically implement uh, similar ransomware in kind of less sophisticated language like .NET. And, you know, if we have this connection between, you know, the group who took these leaked builders and attempted to build it and pack it and deploy it, 
uh, this this Astro Locker 2.0 sample, um, you kind of might imagine that this Chaos Ransomware group, which we have the connection from the uh, Monero wallet, you could say that potentially this group is attempting to re-implement Babuk, re-implement mm -hmm. their ransomware in Chaos, mm -hmm. you know, taking inspiration from an older and more sophisticated group. And maybe mm -hmm. this is, you know, a less sophisticated group, given that, you know, they're writing in an in intermediate language. They're not, you know, writing their malware in something extremely low level. Um, so this is, I mean, it's kind of an indication of how uh, techniques and and malware sort of are exchanged between groups um, and it, it just makes it very difficult to have solid attribution mm -hmm. but um, so we, we can't really rest on the assumptions uh, for attribution that we may have had so joseph i mean one of the things you pointed out in your research was that the the way that this attack was implemented in the word document that was used as the phishing lure required a lot of user interaction like multiple quick clicks to get this thing to launch my understanding is most malicious actors are looking to avoid that type of thing um why do you think that was a feature of this attack and do you think that had any impact on ultimately how many how many victims there were of, of this particular um, Astro Locker 2 uh, campaign? We don't necessarily have uh, information that, you know, th this lure was uh, too elaborate or too complex to work. You know, anything can work. Any amount of clicks can theoretically happen. Um, like you said, it, you know, the less, the fewer clicks to get the malware to launch, the better. But of course, um, you know, some phishing documents, they'll uh, have you click on a link to take you to a website, to have you download a zip, to open up that zip and click on a link file inside. So uh, really any amount of clicks is is still feasible. But um, yeah, I definitely agreed that in this case, the lure wasn't uh, amazingly well formed. Um, it didn't seem like it was an APT level type lure. It wasn't incredibly convincing but yeah i think that definitely goes as to the not necessarily the sophistication of the actor but the amount of time that they've put into yeah. it um it, it really does seem like it they are demoing a technique uh do, demoing an idea um packing you know known malware with uh an obfuscator or packer that seems like their strategy here I think one of the big takeaways from your report is just that, you know, in situations like this, where we have malware like Baba, that's where the source code is leaked, um, it really, that enables a lot of lower level actors or criminals to kind of draft off of that development work that's been done by a cyber criminal group and go out and kind of um, you know strike out on their own to do attacks and operations again leveraging that malware that may not be very sophisticated um, but that could impact your organization uh, even if like this they're sort of smash and grab you know just push them out push the ransomware out right away and see what happens but that could kind of still impact you as an organization even as far-fetched as it sounds right yeah definitely and it it is kind of a, a two-fold story on attribution of course um, because of course when there's a source leak like this you can't uh, place it necessarily with babook or their affiliates but based on the uh, information and the configuration in the malware you can place the date uh, place, you know, the time frame in which it happened. And uh, when you have more information about the uh, how the attack was constructed or maybe where the payload was stored, you can start to make a, a bigger story. But mm. of course, um, when you have a file like this, uh, like this maldoc, you can see that, you know, a lot of impact is still possible. You know, with one uh, phishing email campaign against a company, you, you could still end up with a lot of computers encrypted and in this case, not recoverable. So final question. I mean, what would your advice be to, you know, um, organizations out there, SOCs or security teams um, worried about these types of follow on attacks, um, either using, you know, based on the book 
uh, leaked source code or, or others like it. Um, what can they do? I mean, obviously, you know, train your users not to open random word attachments if they get an email. So I guess that's that's lesson number one. Are there are there other lessons? Sure. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of vectors that that can deliver malware and you know phishing is definitely the most common um, but one thing that we've kind of learned from this research is that there's going to be a long tail to any ransomware operation where the source code has been leaked um, you know these things will continue to live on mm -hmm. and in this sample in particular you know packing it with some very old or obscure obfuscator it's it's always kind of meant to bypass antivirus signatures it's meant to uh, ideally sneak under the radar and not loudly blare it. Um, so malware authors are going to consistently try techniques to pipe, to bypass static detection. Um, and so it, it's like you said, it, it's definitely important to avoid um, being fished, but it's also important to um, have a very up-to-date uh, antivirus solution, whatever that may be, you know, ensure that there's very good detections and, and not just uh, sort of stag static signatures. With, with all that we saw in the sort of the initial stages of this, I guess it was like an Olay object and so on. Is it pretty likely that, that an endpoint detection product would have flagged that as uh, worrying behavior or malicious behavior? Uh, a good endpoint solution would. Yes, yeah. I, I, I believe. <laughs> but of course, uh, when you have a, an object that is compressed, uh, like we know these OLE object, this OLE object uh, in this case was uh, not in itself compressed, but the file format of uh, uh, of a Word document, or you know, it could have been um, an RTF rich text format document. They can mm -hmm. both embed OLE objects, um, mm -hmm. and so it's very easy for us at reversing labs to extract an OLE object and then extract the executable from that. But, you know, for an antivirus, just directly looking at the, the bytes of a word document, not necessarily. Joseph Edwards, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about your work and the uh, analysis you did of this AstroLocker malware and great work. And, and we look forward to having you on again.